and welcome back to the Doom 3 commentary with me, Scully the Metalhead. We're finally back in the UAC base, and, uh, now let's just say the main teleporter chamber has been a little bit more damaged in recent years. Well, I say years, but you know what I mean. Anyway, we are getting incredibly close to the end of the game. Um, basically, and again, I'm going to say this right off the bat since there's going to be a very big lack of things to talk about this part. Um... Expect me to get very lost, there's gonna be petering commentary, because again, as you can guess by the part number, this is a beefer. A very beefy part, and I'm not really sure if I'm gonna be able to carry this one. I do have my juicy tangents about, you know, what we learned in Hell, and I will be talking about those, uh, rather specifically, but at the same time, I think this part might, again, if it doesn't go decently, it's probably gonna be rather shit. But at the same time, again, if I can get this beefy part out of the way, I can get to some of the more interesting story parts. And there is quite a bit to talk about with the story parts, but the problem is, is that I'm worried that I might be so distracted on one story point that I'll forget to talk about something else or bring up a point that I might have had uh, by virtue of, you know, you know, just me being a scatterbrained son of a bitch. And, um, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start off with this with a bit of you know, padding commentary, which is basically just my rambly observations and, you know, generally disjointed thoughts. And when we get into the good shit, and, you know, by that, well, I mean, when we get into some story segments, I'll talk about that for a little bit. Then there'll be a long stretch of gameplay, and from that point on, I shall talk about, uh, basically the tangents that I've been saving, because goddamn am I gonna need them. And, uh, outside from that, yeah, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, the tribes are back for some reason, which is completely bizarre because the vagary is dead. Well, I suppose there could be multiple vagaries, and that's another new element to talk about just before we head off into some story stuff in a little bit. Uh, the Soul Cube. I'm pretty sure the Soul Cube itself brought it up last time, but yes. Uh, kill, I believe it's five enemies, and you'll get, be able to use the Soul Cube. How do you use the Soul Cube? I'm... Yeah, excuse me. How do you use the Soul Cube? Uh, basically, you just press the fire button, and basically you'll shoot the Soul Cube, and I believe it will decimate any enemies and give their health to you. Now, I might be misremembering this here, but I believe the Soul Cube targets the enemy with the most health, and as, a, and as such, I'm not sure if it gives you a full regeneration, or just partially a one, depending upon the enemy you attack. Uh, but rest assured, it is a very helpful... Uh, little gadget to have, and it is one that is actually quite essential on, I believe it's Nightmare difficulty, because in that mode, your health is constantly draining, and the only way you have to refill it is by using the Soul Cube, or by using your wits and brains to survive. Uh, yeah, people comment about, you know, games being too handholdy. yeah, try Doom with its Nightmare mode, because it will kick your ass. And I'm talking in any of the games, like, I mean, Doom 1, 2... And three, presumably Doom 2016 as well, but I have yet to own it, and I really want to because it looks like a very good game. Uh, but in any case, as for what we're going to be doing now, basically heading over to the Central Processing Unit. And in this part, I believe we're going to meet up with Councillor Swan and Campbell again. I brought up how disjointed the story- well, uh, not really disjointed, but more so how, uh how much the story tends to take a backseat to a lot of the events in Doom 3. Uh, but at the same time, we do get an explanation as to what happened to those two. And it is, uh, pretty grim. But I shall save my thoughts when we actually get to meet them. Uh, Campbell will- actually, no, not Campbell. Uh, Swan will actually be seeing in a little bit. Uh, but yeah, to fill up the time. Again, I did mention this last time of how I compared Doom 3's story to Devil May Cry's and that. I don't think Doom 3's story is uh, at all bad, I mean, especially compared to the classic series Devil May Cry's shitty story. But, um, you know, considering that the plot does kind of take a backseat to a plot that you could essentially narrate yourself, I think it can work, but the problem is is that when it comes to story summary, you could mostly sum this up as, you know, Doom Guy fights bad guys, although, in the case of Doom 3, I think it is alleviated a little bit more, mostly by virtue of the PDAs, uh, giving you information about how the story panned itself out. So in many ways, even though people would say that, you know, Doom 3's story is lackluster or in any sense, I would disagree because, again, there's a lot of 
uh, periphery stuff that does tell you exactly what you need to know. Well, need to know, but I say it's more information that is interesting to know. And again, I've mentioned this time and time again throughout the commentary, but again, it is rather personable to see how hell influenced a bunch of different people, whether it be, you know, the demons themselves tempting them, whether it be uh, their fatigue, their fears. Again, it's all very interesting, and it's a style of horror that I think is uh, rather integral to creating an atmospheric video game. I don't know. I mean, I guess it kind of depends upon what kind of uh, horror style you're doing in video games, but I think doing it, you know, via audio recordings or text, again, it's a bit of an age-old practice, as you've seen, you know, throughout many survival horror games like Resident Evil or Silent Hill. But again, it's one that I feel hasn't lost its effectiveness in all the years that I've been playing video games, you know? But in any case... I don't really have too much to say now. Uh, we're getting closer to a certain friend of ours. Well, not really friend, since he kind of cursed us out for summoning the Earth fleet. But yes, we shall be meeting him momentarily. I hope there's no demons in here. Anyway, I shall shut up and you shall now listen to Elliot Swan as he recounts his little adventures before sadly being injured. Still alive? <coughs> Looks like you might be on your own. Sarge is gone. They've got to him. I don't know how long he's been working against us. Uh, he's no longer human. Campbell went after him. He's got to be stopped. <coughs> Hell is breaking through in the caverns. If that portal isn't closed before those ships arrive, Earth will be destroyed. Earth. That's what they've always wanted. They were there once. Lost it in the dawn of time. Now it's so close. They can taste it. It's up to you now. <laughs> Take my PDA, it's got what you need. Good luck. I'm too beat up. I'll slow you down. I'll try to make it out on my own. It's up to you now. I'll try to make it out on my own. Okay, I have a lot to say about what Councillor Swan said about Sergeant Kelly, and as well as his little spiel about how the demons were on Earth before. But first, you must listen to this, and then I'll get back to the tangent. This is the audio log of Councillor Elliot Swan, dated November 15th, 2145. This entire research facility is in chaos. There's at least a 90% death rate among civilian personnel. Whatever Betruger unleashed is literally consuming the base. People have been turned into some sort of undead creatures that are relentless. Campbell and I are making our way towards the communications facility. We must stop all communications. If a distress call leaves the base, then everyone here and on Earth is doomed. This is the audio log of Counselor Elliot Swan, dated November 16, 2145. Campbell and I were unable to reach the main portal in the Delta Complex, but that portal may be inconsequential to a more disturbing discovery. We have uncovered reference to another portal, created by the demons themselves. A passageway between Hell and Mars. We suspect it resides within the cavern somewhere near the archaeological dig. The fleet is on its way. Campbell and I will attempt to move there and somehow either shut it down or destroy it. That... that... hellhole must be closed before the fleet arrives. And that's our next objective. Our first mission is to destroy Sergeant Kelly, and our next mission is to head down to Site 3, deep into the caverns, and destroy the portal. Now then, quite a lot to discuss, and I've got a long time, so I'm gonna do my best to kind of calmly deliver my thoughts, uh, in spite of everything that might be going on on screen, so forgive me if I miss out on, you know, certain details, whatever. Oh, so I should probably turn the volume down, because there's a random spike for some reason. Okay. Uh, first of all, and since I'm probably not gonna mention it uh, that much, since uh, the Sergeant Kelly boss fight in and of itself is actually rather short for me to, you know, really coagulate my thoughts, but... And it's not even in this part now that I think of it, but anyway, I'm just wasting time. Yeah, if it's of no secret to anybody, Sergeant Kelly has been corrupted by the demons, and I use that in quotation marks because 
I don't think he was really fooling anybody. And again, it's a personal belief that I've held ever since I first played this game. I've always thought Sergeant Kelly was working against Doomguy the entire time, in league with Dr. Petruga. And again, a lot of people like to, you know, beg to differ, considering the fact that they seem to be like, oh no, he was corrupted, but again, there's a lot of evidence to support that Sergeant Kelly was usually working against you, and, you know, not only with uh, Councillor Swan's line is that he was in league with Petruga the entire time, but also the fact that one of his lines, uh, the possessed Sergeant Kelly will um, tell, it's a line that I believe goes across as something as, you are always meant to die, Marine. And again, he says that while possessed, and many could make the argument that, oh, he just said that because he was possessed, but considering that, you know, it was Sergeant Kelly who was sending us into all these dangerous situa situations while he was seemingly running around, somehow being safe despite all that was happening, I find it a little bit hard to believe that he was still, you know, part of the good side. Not only that, but another bit of evidence that I think supports my case is that, you know, he was the one who was quite contingent upon saying, Doomguy, you have to contact the fleet on Earth, they have to get to Mars. Which, of course, was what Dr. Petruga wanted. And, again, a lot of people like to bring up the fact that, you know, in our last meeting with Sergeant Kelly, the fact that he was wounded was indicative enough of how he was meant to be, well, you know, uh, still working with us and trying to protect, you know, the human race, but even then, I think that could easily be excused as, you know, him being transmogrified into his boss form. Because again, as we will later see with Dr. Petruga when he turns into the final uh, boss, so to speak, again, it's nothing... well, I say final boss, but that's a tangent in and of itself, but, you know, you could easily just misconstrue that as, you know, final boss transformation that we didn't exactly see the full process of. So again, to a lot of people that think that Sergeant Kelly was working with you know, Doom Guy, and was there for the good of humanity, I find that pretty hard to believe. And again, I think only hardcore Doom players would really uh, get the gist of that, because again, we don't really see Sergeant Kelly that often, but given his actions, his motivations, I think it does make sense that he would be palling around with Petruga, because, you know, again, a lot of his goals coincided with Petruga's, and he didn't really seem to be... Uh, that contingent upon getting survivors out either, because again, we met many scientists, we met many personnel all across the UAC, base, the UAC base, but again, he was just contingent on call the fleet and get us the hell out of here. Oh, and there is one funny thing that I want to point out here. Uh, since the UAC base has become possessed, what you saw there was instructions. What are they for? They're basically the demons giving themselves instructions on how to summon a portal to Mars. Again, if you can read the message there, it says, Our time has finally come to feast upon the souls of the humans. And it basically just lists off a bunch of instructions as to how to summon portals. It's like, Virgin blood is best blood. Goat's blood must be no older than three days. Remove all entrails and place candles from left to right, not the other way around. <laughs> I don't know, I think it's rather funny. This, I believe, will be the longest segment, and that's mostly because I think I tend to get a little bit lost in this area. Uh, again, I'll show off most of this area, since, again, I think it is probably in bad form that I don't show off a lot of this place. But again, there was a lot of times when I was half tempted to cut a lot of this stuff out, and again, I still might, because it will give me an excuse to include the Optimus, Pi the Optimus Prime transition thing, that I haven't really used that often in this game since I guess it is mostly linear for the most part, but yeah, the little server area, you can get a little bit lost if you don't know what you're doing, and hell, even if you do know what you're doing, I still tend to get a little bit lost. And again, I guess a lot of people could use that to the detriment of this game, it's a rather homogenous looking level design, well not level design, I should say more, uh, level aesthetics would be the proper term to use. Uh, but that being said though, I do think the CPU area does have some pretty fantastic looking uh, aesthetics in and of itself, because again, I love the use of lighting here. Like, I mean, not only does it go to show Hell's corrupting influence, but it also shows, like, a very industrial looking thing, and again, maybe it's just me, but I love that kind of art design. Kind of art design that I think is lacking in this day and age. 
Well, that's pretty scary. I also really like the soundtrack part uh, for this part of the game. Like, again, it's very... Again, it starts to pick up a little bit. Again, it's not exactly uh, music in the traditional sense as much as it is ambience, but it does pick up a little bit. And that is something that I think is pretty cool. And again, something I uh, just remembered, and something that I think I was supposed to mention during the Hell segment, but I didn't because my scatterbrained self couldn't remember it. Um, we hear all this talk about, you know, demons of hell and, you know, the devil and everything else like that. But the one thing that's always made me curious about Doom, and one thing that I don't think was ever really mentioned outside of one instance in the Resurrection of Evil, is angels. Again, we never hear any mention or get any kind of appearance of angels or any kind of, you know, heavenly, uh, signif- well, any kind of heavenly, uh, stuff. And again, that's always confused me, because you'd think in a game like Doom, that there would have been some kind of push-pull, good versus evil kind of thing going on, I mean... I don't know. Like, I mean, Doom has always been rather binary in its conflict. Like, and especially even in the case of this game, where the Soul Cube deems Doom Guy its savior, but again, you never hear anything about angels in this universe, I mean... Hell, even the Doom movie, for as horrible as it was, at the very least, it still had that little plot point about, oh, but 10% of the human genome is unmapped and it dictates good versus evil, even though those concepts, on a scientific level, are unquantifiable. I don't know, there's just something I feel probably could have been done with this, and again, I'm not sure if Doom 4 does anything with this, I, I'm going to assume no, but if it does, and if anybody in the comments is, gonna t is willing to tell me, then please do so. But again, I'd like to see something involving, like, some kind of polar opposite force of the, uh, demons. Like, you know, angel-style, uh, things. I don't know, like, I mean, I think it would really do well to, like, give a bit more of a balanced aesthetic. And, again, it's a bit of an undeveloped idea, I will admit. But again, it is a bit of a push-pull dynamic that I think probably could work, uh, depending upon how well the concept is fleshed out. Because, again, like, again, you see demons everywhere, and I guess part of the action and horror comes from, you know, you, one normal human guy facing against all odds. And again, that is really cool, but I think from a story perspective, there is something very interesting that could be done with uh, the concept of angels and how they could oppose the demons. I don't know. Then again, as, uh, then again, as I've probably come across in previous parts, I'm probably the kind of person that's a little bit too invested in the Doom storyline for his own good. But again, you know, I'm not even a, again like I'm not even a writer, but there's a lot of potential with Doom in terms of its plot and everything else that I feel is again it kind of aggravates me that it just goes uncapitalized, you know? Like again, I do recall hearing that there were some exp some uh what's the word? Now, for the lack of a better word, I'll say expanded material with like a novel, I believe, but I think that was just a straight up adaptation of Doom 3, but Honestly, though, like, I mean, if, and again, I've mentioned this time and time again, but if id Software were to have a side series, you know, running across, you know, the more action-oriented Doom that a lot of people love, but then have, like, a horror-style Doom, which, you know, delves more into the story and lore and everything, I'd just, I'd be really interested in that. But then again, considering how, uh, well, Doom 2016 did, I don't think that id Software will do anything like that anytime soon, and that does sadden me, but... In a general sense, I do hope to see at least some kind of expansion upon the concept of angels, or at the very least an expansion upon the storyline in general. <sighs> yeah, I believe this is the portion I cut out because... Yeah, just nothing more than codes, and I didn't bother to use the Optimus Prime tra transition just yet, because I was rather pointless. Anyway, on to my next t juicy tangent. And that will be right after this little cutscene. Ah. Well, it's nice to see that Hell apparently has corrupted Mars so much that everything is starting to look like Hell and we're getting these rather fleshy masses that remind me of Silent Hill 4 with the uh, giant tapeworm creature. Oh, Jesus. Fucking cherubs, I hate you so much. Uh, but in any case, uh, coming out, we actually do have a PDA 
uh, section that's coming up next, and that, and I do have to apologize for that one because again there is a bit of enemy fire, and a bit of stuff that does interfere with a dialogue. Normally I wouldn't do such a thing, but again these things happen. Uh, but in a general sense, I do have my tangents, and again I wanted to say them right now, but I'll save them for a little bit later. But in any case, my next tangent will be stuff about the Soul Cube slash the ancient Martian civilization that was mentioned before. I think I can expand upon that a little bit more, though it's mostly regarding the Soul Cube. And weirdly their name, which I think was, and again I couldn't really make it out, but I think it was called the Praylanthor, I think? Yeah, that's another thing that I think I could talk about for hours on end, because I mean, you know, you have stuff about angels, but I think it might be possible that they could be the angels, possibly, in their language. Which I find rather confusing since, you know, demons are just called demons, apparently. Then again, I suppose we haven't really heard the ancient term, because again, they just refer to the demons as the evil. You know, in just a rather general sense. But anyway, here's the PDA and I'll shut up. This is the audio log of Charlie Haskell, Delta Labs technician, dated September 23rd, 2145. We're making good progress in increasing the max range of Chamber 3 in the Delta Complex. We've been crunching numbers all night and feel that with a few slight modifications, we should be able to boost output to cover all of Delta. The latest schedule changes are wreaking havoc on our current systems, and it's not uncommon to see system utilization at 99% for days at a time. We understand that Lab A has finally received the NREC 6809 systems. Please consider this a formal request for a block of two hours to run our latest formulas at the soonest available time. Well now. Not quite sure why I made the cut there. Um, sorry for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm just looking at my edited timeline. Uh, I should probably turn the volume down a little, a little bit, and I believe I might have made that cut just for the sake of time. Um, yeah. The weird thing is, is that I actually made a day between uh, recording sessions because uh, life and all kinds of things got in the way and, <clears throat> you know, these things happen. Oh, now I remember why I made the editors, because I wanted to cut out this pointless sequence where I end up not being able to get the code. Rawr, 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 rawr. But yeah. In any case, still got a long stretch of time before anything happens. Mostly just a lot of fighting and a lot of, you know, back and forth traveling, which... Again, I will say that it's probably a little bit more fun to play this area than it is to, you know, watch me commentate over it. But in retrospect... You know, it packs decent ambience, uh, but it just leaves you with uh, with very little to talk about. So I guess Doom 3 is a bit of an anti-commentary game in that sense, but, you know, I think there's enough content packed in story-wise to really give me something to talk about, because, you know, doing Doom 3, or at least as far as I'm concerned, as far as my experience with commentary is concerned, to me it's the only real game that I can really feasibly see myself talking over, because I mean, I could do the original Doom as I had actually initially wanted to way back in uh, 2015 when I was still doing the Matrix Path of Neo, but I just thought about it for a little bit and I wasn't really sure what I'd really have to talk about, because I mean, I could talk about gameplay, but yeah, at the same time there wasn't really much I could add to the overall lore, you know? Which is why I think Doom 3 is a little bit easier of a game to get yourself accustomed to as far as commentary is concerned. No, oh, we haven't seen these enemies in a while. But, um, yeah, in order, to, in order to fill the time, as it were, I do have another thing that I do want to announce, uh, albeit in Doom 3, and it's something that I've been contemplating for quite a while now. Um, but I mentioned, like, way back in my Matrix Path of Neo commentary, and even during the Doom 3 commentary, is that I wanted to, you know, play Assassin's Creed next. And I'm going to be cancelling that, sadly, Mostly because I feel that the, you know, 53, is it 51 or 53 minutes? Not too sure, but it's at least near an hour. Yeah, I feel that the review kind of covered everything that I really needed to cover about Assassin's Creed. I mean, I mean, everything that I could have talked about in a commentary of that game, I pretty much surmised in the review. Uh, so in a general sense, I still haven't decided what I'm going to be playing next, but Assassin's Creed is off the cards, and again, if you really want to see my full opinion on it, I'd suggest you go check out my review that I made in 2016. Well, I wrapped that up a lot quicker than I thought I would. Yeah, I think this is why I probably should have edited this a little bit more. 
Uh, don't worry though, I mean this part is a lot longer because there is an upcoming death uh, shortly, but I do cut out the second attempt or at least a good chunk of it and then get things back on track. And of course it gives me leeway to use the Optimus Prime transition again. Christ, that was rather frightening. But then again, as you could see there from the amount my health was being drained, that's the danger of the cherubs. Uh, let's see, what more do I have to talk about? Uh, Shumura. Oh god. Oh, that was a bit frightening. Um, don't really have much to say. I think, and again, I'm not really too sure uh, where I said this or if I said it earlier or if I'm going to be repeating myself, but um, yeah, talking about the Soul Cube, I guess. Because again, we have recently acquired it, and again, it seems that they seem to herald Doom Guy as their champion. Or at the very least, someone who can take down Hell's Mightiest Warrior. Who is Hell's Mightiest Warrior? Well, if you played the game, then you already know the answer to that. But I think one might suspect, if you were just watching this commentary, that it'd be Dr. Petruga. Although, if you know your Doom 3 uh, history, then you'd know that that's a little bit of an odd misnomer. Also a bit of sequel baiting, but again, that wasn't really resolved uh, since Doom 4 never came to fruition. That being said, though, I mean, this actually does give me something to talk about. Uh, what exactly would have a, you know, proverbial Doom 4 have been like? Because, I mean, we had the Doom 2016 uh, reboot. But again, I've always wondered what a Doom 4 would have been like. I mean, I can imagine that it probably would have been more action-oriented, like the game we have with the reboot. But I'm wondering if there would have been more horror elements or storyline elements that would have been included from Doom 3. Because, I mean, even despite the time gap of a little over 10 years... I still think a Doom 4 probably could have worked. Like, I mean, even with the horror aesthetics, and especially as I brought up far earlier with Resident Evil 7, it kind of bridging the gap between action and horror, I think that it probably could have been uh, feasible. Then again, I don't know what id Software's plans, you know, for Doom are in the future, so I'll probably just have to wait and see, but I can imagine they'll probably continue to go down the action route, but nonetheless, if they ever do decide to make another horror game, I will have no complaints. Jesus. Oh god, Archviles, yep. This is death time. Yeah, you do- <laughs> This is kind of a nightmare room for me, but anyway, Optimus Prime Transition, activate. Transformers. And we're back! Howdy, hello! God, what the fuck was that from? Uh, but yeah, did a bit of editing, and, uh, I'm serious, man, like, I mean, if it wasn't noticeable before, but look at it now, I mean, like, a lot of people would say that Doom 3's areas are homogenous, as I've said so many times throughout this commentary, but again, you've seen there that Hell is already taking a much stronger corrupting influence into the game, and holy shit, god, the imps are fucking terrifying. But yeah, again, it's a subtle change, but it's one that I do really appreciate about Doom 3 when it really gets to endgame. Because, like, I mean, see this, as I mentioned during the Hell segment, even if you don't have, you know, people running and screaming on Earth, uh, contextualizing the urgency of your situation, the dilapidation of the base, I think, is urgency enough to give the player the indication of, holy shit, Hell's getting really powerful right now, we gotta stop this immediately. Like, I mean, it's gone from, you know, small psychological happenings to something that was, you know, full-blown Hell. Which is... Which, in retrospect, I think is something that probably should have been a little bit more uh, emphasized. Because, like, I mean, uh, earlier one of the more iconic scenes of Doom is the bathroom scene where Doom guy looks into a mirror and then he starts seeing red and, you know, the whole world kind of turns hellish for a little bit. But honestly, I think early, the earlier parts of the game probably could have used more of those moments. Because, again, like, we did have those scattered about every now and again. But I don't think they were frequent enough, you know, to really give the sense of, like, Oh god, there is something... there is a much bigger threat that's looming above us. Which I suppose also could have acted as like a nice hint towards like what boss was going to be going, which I think if you wanted to, if you wanted to emphasize the horror of Doom 3, then I think that would have been fantastic in, you know, getting people on edge, you know, keeping them on their toes, and also doing it as a way to introduce the boss monster a little bit before you actually face them, just to ramp up that tension a little bit. Again, I think Doom 3 does a decent enough job of that already with its bosses, but... 
in any respect, I think it just would have would have you know given it that bit of extra push. Seriously though, it's software. I am willing to work. I am a horror genius, or at least I like to claim that I am. Anyway, we have another cutscene coming up, so I shall remain silent and take a drink of the Pepsi. Sarge, <sighs> find him. Oh, gotta find him. My gun. He's got my gun. <sighs> and so ends Campbell's role in the game. I killed that pathetic bodyguard, and now I will kill you. You see, lines like that still make me believe that Sergeant Kelly was always against Doom Guy. I mean, ugh. I've said all I really needed to in the previous part, and I'll probably continue to have a little ramble about that in the next part where we actually do face off against Sergeant Kelly, but... Uh, I'm sorry, but I just don't buy that, you know, he was working for the good guys, quote-unquote. But in any case, I'm Scully, keep a new metal, and I'll see you next time in the Doom 3 commentary. Peace out, guys.